Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Hay. Um, I work for a company called Event ROI, and we provide uh, return on investment services for the meeting industry across Europe. Um, we're going to be talking for the next 30 minutes about how to measure the effectiveness of your events. Does anybody currently measure their events in any way at all? In terms of satisfaction or a small show of hands? Okay. So we're speaking to some converted, um, but uh, the rest of you are not doing anything currently. Hopefully, at the end of this next 30 minutes, we'll give you some ideas about how perhaps you could introduce some measurement into the meeting and events that you're currently <laughs> conducting, and give you some tools and some ideas and some tips as to how you can improve that in the future. So, without further ado, why ROI? Why are we being asked? these days, and some of you obviously are because you're actually doing it, maybe a lot of you are not because there hasn't been an opportunity for anybody to ask you the question, what was our return on investment on that event? We just spent, maybe we're spending 60,000, 80,000, 100,000, 250,000 on a conference. The pharmaceutical industry spends 2% of their revenue on conferences. Wow. Imagine how much GSK or Sanofi or Pfizer or any of these big companies are spending on conferences to convince their clients, whether they're doctors, uh, medical people, whatever it may be, to buy their particular product. It is a huge amount of money. If anybody's familiar with SAP, they do. Is that, does anybody work for SAP? No? They hold a huge conference called Sapphire. And again, the guy who organizes that, Lucas <coughs> Avetta, is very much aware of the need to measure the return on investment because his C-level executives, CFO, CIO, CMO, whatever it might be, CEO, are asking the question, Luca, you just spent a huge amount of money on this conference, millions of pounds, millions of euros, what have we got to show for it? And if all you can tell, or all you can say at the end of the day, well, everybody had a great time, they're up in the bar till three o'clock in the morning, drank the place dry, and everybody had a great time, that doesn't really show a return on investment. The other thing is the role of the meeting planner is changing. This may or, you may be already experiencing this. But historically, it was very much in the logistic box. You were very much involved in logistics, getting the revenue, uh, the, uh, the, the venue, organizing transportation, the food and beverage, the speakers, the setups, and what have you. Very much a logistic role. Been at a lot of companies now, the C level executives are recognizing that events, meetings and what have you. Certainly events are part of the marketing budget and every other aspect of that marketing budget is being measured in some way. So they're now beginning to say, well, we're holding all these events, client events, whatever they may be. How can we measure it in the same way that we're measuring our other marketing activities? Similarly, the CFOs and C-level are saying, about all of their events. They said, well, why are we holding this event? What return on investment have we got? What does it do to move the dial in the way that we're running our business? So first of all, there is this aspect that the role is changing of the meeting planner to become more strategic as companies are recognizing the amount of money they're spending on meeting and events, and they don't really know what they're getting out of it. So those are some of the things we will address in the next 30 minutes or so. The problem is, a lot of people say, oh, it's awfully complicated, it's all mathematical, I've got to do so much work to be able to measure these events. Yes, if you're really going to measure the return on investment at a high level, there is a lot of effort involved in terms of data collecting, converting things to, to monetize it and what have you, to be able to show the benefits of the meeting versus the costs of the meeting. Because at the end of the day, if we've got some costs involved, hopefully there's some benefits as well. But what I'm going to discuss uh, in the next 30 minutes is that we don't have to measure everything to a full ROI perspective and there's some simple things that we can do to start off with to move the dial and to start implementing some measurement tools within the meetings for the meetings and events that we currently uh, conduct. So let me start off by telling you a story about there was a franchise cleaning company and uh, they would already, uh, already organized an event. This is an annual event they always held and it was you know, the usual sort of format, the CEO would stand up, the financial director would stand up and show how wonderful they've been, and the marketing people would tell about all the new initiatives that they were going to introduce, and the salespeople were there and what have you. They'd have a gala dinner, they'd have a motivational speaker, 
Sounds familiar? These are sort of things that a lot of companies organize, but have they really decided what it is that they want to accomplish? So the CEO of this particular company approached one of our colleagues, Mark, and said, look, you know, we want to know, are we getting return on investment for this particular event? And he described what they're doing and what have you. And Mark asked a few simple questions. He said, why are you holding this event? What are your objectives? And that got them thinking, well, I'm not quite sure why we're doing it. You know, well, we want to get all the franchise together, okay. What is it you want them to do differently? And why aren't they already doing it? And this really posed some serious questions to the franchise uh, senior management and what have you. So he said, well, let's break it down. Let's start off with, well, who's your audience? And within this uh, franchise setup, there were people who'd got small businesses, some had got larger businesses, some had only just recently started with this particular franchisor in the cleaning world, some were quite extensive doing a lot of contract catering. So it was a wide range of people. And he said, well, what is it that each of those groups want to learn? What is it that would help them improve their business? So they determined, in fact, that there was a lot of uh, maybe financial help they could provide. They could perhaps provide some help with their sales techniques. They could perhaps provide them with greater technical support to help them <laughs> use the equipment more effectively to, in, to help them reduce their costs. So there's lots of little different things that they decided that perhaps these franchisees needed to know, needed to understand, be able to run their business better. Because at the end of the day, what does the franchise company want to do? They want to increase their sales. If the franchisees are successful in their own businesses, then they're going to get more money as well. So by asking those first few questions, why are you holding this event? What are your objectives? What do you want your audience to do differently if they're not already doing? And how can we help them do that? Then they decided then to change the whole format because what the organization realized is that what they needed to do wasn't what they had already planned. Fortunately, the venue did have some extra space, so they canceled the motivational speaker, they changed the different events set up, and they had a lot of business exchange um, events, which were then much more successful because it helped the company achieve their objectives, which is obviously to increase sales. It helped the other stakeholders achieve their objective, the franchisees, because now they were learning some new skills to help them improve their business. <coughs> so just by asking a few simple questions, the whole format and structure of that meeting was changed, and it became much more successful. So again, think about why you're <coughs> holding this event, and what is it that you want to accomplish. So, what we're trying to do when we're holding our events is hopefully create some value to our organizations. Otherwise, why on earth are you holding these events unless you're trying to create some value for them? So we're trying to influence participants to do something which adds value to stakeholders. And again, think about all the different stakeholders that might be involved in the particular meetings that you're running or the events that you're running. Maybe the budget holder, maybe the chief marketing officer, maybe the director of sales, maybe the head of training, maybe the head of HR, the participants are stakeholders as well. What are, they, what are their objectives in coming to this particular event? At the lowest possible cost, because again, we're all very conscious these days of how much we're spending on everything we do, and we've got to show return on that investment. So one of the questions that Mark asked, why are you holding this event? Why do people hold events? All sorts of different reasons, I'm sure. But if you boil it down, it usually comes down to three particular areas as to why people hold events. So think about the events that you may be holding within your organization. One of them is knowledge. We want to impart some knowledge to another group of stakeholders to help them do a better job in whatever they're doing, or help educate them about some aspects of the company, whether it's a product launch, some new health and safety regulations, some new legislation that may have come in, um, different things that might be happening in your organization or in your own worlds where you need to impart some knowledge. So that's one of the reasons why we hold events. Secondly, networking. Very often, whether it's in, within our own organizations or with our client or customer organizations, we want to improve the relationships that we can better network with those people. Why do we want to do that? 
because we want to sell to you. Whether you're an insurance company, a pharmaceutical company, automotive, <coughs> financial, whatever it is, we're networking with those people with a view that we can improve sales to that particular client base. So very often we do some networking to get to know corporate events are a prime example of this. Why do we invite people to Wimbledon? Why do we take them to the Formula One? Why do we take them to um, different sports events and what have you? To get to know them better. And people say, well, how do you measure that type of event? Well, maybe if we found out beforehand, ask the participants, ask the sales team, on a scale of 10, how well do you know these people? What do we know about them? What's the value of their business? Then you hold the event, everybody gets to get to know each other a lot better, the salespeople get to know their customers a lot better, and they said, okay, based on a scale of one to 10, how well do you know them now? What will that relate to, and what will that mean in terms of sales in the future? So networking is another one. Again, um, maybe your company is merged with another company. It happened to me when I was in the hotel business. Marriott took over some hotels in the UK, and we had a lot of networking events to get to know the other team, to understand their culture, so that we could merge those together to make it a much more successful business. So maybe that's another type of networking that's going on. And again, why do we hold those events? Because we want to have a much more successful business, and that's the, the reason why we did that. The third reason, the third main reason why you might be holding meetings or events is to motivate people. I know we're competing with Christmas parties over here in the, the other room. Why do people hold Christmas parties? Part of it is to recognize people, maybe at the end of the year. Part of it is to motivate people to feel better about the company, pat them on the back, say what a great job you've done, we've had a really great year. Well, how do you measure the ROI on that? Well, do we increase sales the following year, or do we <coughs> save costs? Do we reduce our turnover of staff as a result of the relationships and the motivation that we've engendered at that particular event, and therefore we're saving the cost, maybe in the first quarter, of in hiring new people, because we've lost a lot of people. So again, you've always got to think about, well, why are we doing this? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to increase sales or reduce costs by holding this event? And then the next question that Mark asks is, what are your objectives? What is it you're trying to accomplish, either from a business impact perspective, or what is it that we need them to learn from a knowledge perspective? So these are some of the questions that you need to start asking when you're holding events. And it might be upsetting to some of the senior management if you're a meeting planner and you've been told to organize this event, if you ask the question, why are we holding this event? Well, don't you, well, if the chairman wants to hold this event. Okay. What are our objectives? And that gets people coming short because maybe they haven't thought it through enough to understand why you're holding the event and then what are the objectives. So we'll help you with one or two questions there as well. So we've got to link needs with evaluation. We're going to be able to evaluate these events to see whether we have got a return on investment. Then we've got to say, well, why are we actually holding it in the first place? What are our needs? So there's different levels that we need to look at. Maybe at the CFO level, he's saying, you know, we're spending all of this on our meeting and events this year. What's the payoff? What are we getting back in return? And that's where you'd establish your ROI objectives. Or it may be there's a business need. Maybe there's a crisis in your business. Maybe you're launching a new product. Maybe you need to, there's some you know, health and safety regulations changing. Maybe some new legislation which is changing the the playing field for your particular company. Can you imagine the meetings that have gone on in VW in the past year, in terms of the challenge they've had with that uh, um, diesel um, control mechanism, and the meetings that they must be doing now to try and change people's perception about the business. Huge business need there. Similarly with Sports Direct. I know Mr. Ashley and uh, the ways he's been running the business, and again, in the news recently, in terms of the minimum wage in their warehouse in, in Derbyshire, again, there's some cultural changes that need to take place in that business. A, to convince customers still to buy their product, but also to maintain the staff by fostering a better working environment there for them. So there's some, sometimes there's some business needs that you need to be looking at in terms of, well, why are we holding this meeting? 
is there a specific business need for us to hold this particular meeting or event? And then establish what we call some impact objectives. What is it going to do with regards to the success of our particular business? So it's not, if it's not going to change the business and improving sales or reducing costs, then why are we holding this event? We're all people businesses. Therefore, we need to look at behavior. What is it we want people to do differently? And how can we establish some application objectives to help them do something differently, which will then have a business impact? They have to change behavior. Maybe they need to learn some new skills, change their attitude, improve their relationships, whatever it may be. <coughs> and we look at also preference needs, reaction. What do we expect their reaction to be to our particular event? And again, setting all objectives in each of these <coughs> areas so that we can measure these after the event. Sometimes you have to do some measurement beforehand. Where are we starting from? What's our current base of knowledge? What are we doing in terms of developing a learning program to help people learn something new? And then how can we measure that afterwards? So some things we do when the meeting is conceived, some things then we have to do before the meeting, and then some things after the meeting as well. So then it's all part of this process to be able to measure the effectiveness of your meeting and events. But it all starts with getting the right people. You've got to get the right people to the meeting. If it's just a numbers game, then you're wasting a lot of your resources in getting people involved in a conference or event um, that are not really the right people. Again, I remember when I was in the hotel business, we used to do a lot of what we call familiarization trips, where you'd take groups of clients over to see our hotels in New York or Washington. Um, those are days when we used to fly Concorde as well. It's wonderful. Um, and you get all the top players in the travel agencies or the incentive companies or the meeting companies and what have you and say, right, we're going to take you over to see our wonderful new uh, New York Marriott Marquis on Times Square. And then someone will call up and say, I'm awfully sorry, I can't come. Do you mind if I send my secretary? And you think, what? Is she the right target audience for us? No, she's not. But do you turn the customer down? Very difficult thing. But what I press upon you is sort of make sure you get the right target audience who's coming to that particular event. Secondly, then, creating a satisfaction and learning environment which is appropriate. Now, this is a most difficult room to work because we're very thin and long. And I'm sure many of you, when choosing venues, will choose the venue which is most appropriate, the type of event that you're looking to put on, so that you get the right learning environment, where it's in terms of temperature. This room is quite warm. It's 3.30 in the afternoon, 10 to 4. I'm sure a lot of you are getting quite warm here. Um, whether the lighting's right, so the sound system works, all those sort of things are an intrinsic part of the learning environment. So let's look at some satisfaction and reaction objectives. These sort of things, this is the important line. Focus on content issues when you're doing reaction to a particular venue. Don't ask people, was the food on time? Was the coffee hot? Did the air conditioning work? Could you see the speaker? You can tell that by walking into the room. You don't need to ask 300 people what their reaction was to those logistics things. What you're trying to find out here are some content issues. Focus on the content issues. How relevant is this program? Will you use the concept or advice as a result of attending this event? Is this new information? Did you already know this? Those sort of reaction and satisfaction objectives that you should be setting and the sort of questions you should be asking so everybody's scribbling notes. I'm very happy to send you copies of these slides if you want to after to save you writing all this down for a furious ray. So we've got the target audience. Satisfaction and learning environment is critically important to make sure that people are in the right frame of mind to be able to learn. Then we go into the learning stage in terms of what is it we want people to learn, to change their attitude, to have a business in different areas that we need to look at in terms of setting those learning objectives. Is it a question of imparting information? As we said before, technical information, safe, uh, health and safety, uh, legislation maybe, whatever it may be, that we need people to learn and understand to be able to change their behavior. 
Is it skills? Maybe they're new skills that people need to learn to be able to do the job better, whether they're working in a customer service environment, at the telephone reception center, on the front line, face to face with your customers, whatever it may be. But are there skills that they need to learn? As I said, my background is in hotel sales and, and marketing, but we did an awful lot of training, customer um, face to face type training, to make sure that our staff were providing the best level of service, the highest level of service to the customers that we were dealing with, or well, that the food was presented well, that the chefs were preparing it right, that the waiters knew how to present them. Maybe a completely different level to what you may be working with in your organization, just to give you an idea of the sort of things that sometimes the skill deficiency is there that you need to look at so that they can improve their performance. Maybe it's attitudes. Maybe you have merged with another company. Maybe there's something going on in your environment where people's attitude isn't as positive as perhaps it could be to make sure they are working in the best interests of the company. A lot of attitude training maybe needs to go on within the Labour Party, I think, at the moment. <laughs> Boy. Um, relationships. It may be that you need to improve relationships. We talked about networking. But again, what is it that we can do to help improve in relationships so that we can have a more successful business at the end of the day. So there's four different things there that we need to look at from the learning objectives perspective. And again, just some simple ideas of the sort of learning objectives that you should establish so that you can then measure them, measure them at the end of the day. And it may be that you only just measure the satisfaction reaction if you're not already doing it based on content issues. And maybe then you can move up to the next level and start measuring some learning objectives. So the next one is behavior. What's the point of going, I often say this to the students, I, I, I um, train um, in sort of hotel environment. I said, you know, we're gonna spend two days here together, we're gonna learn some new skills, but it's a waste of your time, my time, and the company's time if it doesn't change behavior. So always at the end of the training session, we say, what is it you're gonna do differently that you weren't doing before, which will have a business impact. So that's what we're talking about in terms of behavior. What applicant, how are they going to apply the new skills or whatever it is, new understanding, to change their behavior, which will then have a business impact. So again, some examples there of application objectives as well. Again, what we're trying to do here is introduce some words which you perhaps use when you're setting those application objectives. Trying to increase this, decrease that, eliminate, maintain, whatever it might be. Again, think about those sort of action words when you're, applying, when you're establishing those application objectives. So we've got the right target audience. We've established some satisfaction learning environment. We've established what the learning objectives are. We've looked at behavior objectives then hopefully all of this is then going to have a business impact. Because again, why are you holding this event if it isn't going to move the dial? We're spending a lot of money on this particular event, but is it going to change or improve our business performance, either improving sales or reducing costs? And many companies will just get to that level because the budget holder or the person organizing this meeting has an immediate business need that he, needs, she or, he or she needs addressing and to measure something at that business level, that impact level, is perhaps as far as some people would want to go. However, if you're a large pharmaceutical company, uh, maybe a big insurance company, uh, the SAP, the technical people that I, I mentioned to you, um, they measure their major events at this higher level, the ROI. This does take time. You've got to have the resources, you've got to have the time and the budget to be able to do this because there's quite a lot of information you need to collect. Not impossible, but you've got to recognize that not every event you're going to be able to, to measure this level, unless your company's got very deep pockets. Once you've done all of that, establish what we're going to do. Some bright spark is going to ask the question, well, this is all very well. You hold this event, and you say you're measuring, what have you. But there's lots of other stuff going on in the marketplace. Maybe we've had a big PR campaign. Maybe we've launched a new advertising campaign. Maybe one of our customers has gone out of business. Maybe they've withdrawn from the marketplace, and guess what? Our sales have gone up. 
So how can we measure then the effect of this particular meeting when all this other stuff is going on in the marketplace? But again, there's various techniques to be able to do that. Um, you could have a control group. You could look at some timelines. You can do some forecasting. You could ask the participants themselves. Based on your attendance in this event, what impact has it had in improving sales or reducing costs? And they'll give you an estimate on that as well. So again, we need to isolate that to be able to justify what it is that we're trying to measure and to be able to show that this particular event, this particular meeting, whatever it is, has had this impact irrespective of what else is going on in the marketplace. To be able to measure at that ROI level, we've got to monetize everything. We've got everything into a monetary context so that we can measure it. Now, measuring the cost of the meeting is perhaps quite easy because you know what you're spending on the venue, on the speakers, on transportation, on food and beverage, on AV, on stage setup, and what have you. You can even measure the cost of the time that it takes for those participants to come along to your particular event. So you can do that certainly from the cost side. The challenge is measuring it from the benefit side. What's the benefit of this event? How can I measure that? And again, we need to be able to show by talking to the participants, looking at the measurement criteria we've got within our companies, isolating the impact of that particular event, to say, right, these are the benefits from this particular meeting, so we can compare those with the costs. So all of this comes under this ROI methodology, which has been developed some time. Jack and Patty Phillips um, have written, written many books on this subject, and lots of practitioners around the world. Um, I first got involved with this uh, when I was a member of Meeting Professionals International, MPI. Anybody a member of MPI? Anybody heard of MPI? MPI is the largest meeting association for meeting planners. There are over 23,000 members, and there's chapters in many European countries as well as in the United States. And MPI members were coming to the executive of MPI about 10, 15 years ago, and saying, look, you know, we've been challenged by our major corporations to be able to measure the effectiveness of our events. So MPI went out and found Jack and Patty Phillips, who've got this ROI methodology, which has been established for many years, and it has an evaluation framework, there's a process to it, there's applications and practice, they've written many books on it, and it has some operating standards and philosophy. So even if your CFO is challenging you, say, well, you know, ROI, I understand that, but show me what you are doing has some basis and some credibility. And again, the ROI methodology has been used in many different environments to be able to prove that, in fact, it is a very robust uh, process. Now we come to the mass part. How do you define return on investment? As I said, you don't do this on a small number of uh, meetings, possibly. But again, it just gives you an idea whether we're working on a benefit-cost ratio or looking at the actual ROI on this particular event. So we look at the meeting benefits, which I said earlier, we need to be able to capture and be able to measure those. We've increased sales or reduced costs by this amount. This is the benefit from this particular meeting. And dividing that by the meeting cost, be able to get that benefit-cost ratio. Or to do an ROI, you take the meeting benefits, subtract the meeting cost, and divide by the meeting cost. Let's look at an example. The cost of the meeting is 80,000. Benefits for the first year, 240,000. Anybody tell me what the BCR is, the benefit cost ratio? <coughs> Which drive your misery. Three. So you take benefit divided by the cost 80 into 243. 200% ROI. Then the next question is, is that good or is that bad? Well, until you start doing a certain number of meetings and look at the different return on investment you're getting, you're not going to have any sort of benchmark to be able to measure this against. Fortunately, as I said, Jack and uh, uh, Patty Phillips have written many books on these, including some on measuring uh, the effect of or the impact of meetings and events. So there's lots of examples in there that you could even have a look at and say, well, that's very similar to my event. They got this sort of return on investment. Maybe this is what we should be aiming for. But as I said, then you've got large events and the budget, the data, the resources to be able to do it, would you get to that RRA example? What I'm encouraging you to do is to think about how you can move up that pyramid from a satisfaction reaction level 
to start measuring learning application and business impact objectives as well. So see how easy it is? It takes a lot of time, but it's well worth the end of the day because as I said, your role is changing from a logistics role in many companies into a more strategic role as companies recognize A, how much they're spending on meeting events, and B, with many companies, it's part of the marketing spend and they need to be able to show the return on investment. So here you have a tool now that you can use and say, hey guys, this is something that perhaps we could implement to at least start measuring some of the other things other than the fact that everybody had a great time. Because believe me, if you're not already doing it, guess what, your companies will begin to ask these sort of questions. And it may be, feather in your cap, if you say, do you know what, I think we ought to start looking at this because I know we're spending a lot of money and we need to be able to measure some of these things more accurately to be able to justify the budget. But a lot of organizations, if you can't show that it's been worthwhile, guess what, that budget gets taken away. So, rather than just saying, hey, everybody had a great time, yeah, we're going to hold it again next year and we'll just use the same format and everybody seems to be happy with it, based on anecdotal evidence in the bar at 2 o'clock in the morning, why can't we produce a scorecard measuring some of these things as well. To be able to say, not only do we have a number of participants, we have this many meetings, but we were able to measure the amount of learning that people did and how they related to that event, what their reaction to it was, what they learned, how they applied that, and did it in fact have a business impact. Where can we go to get some resources? A couple of things. Eventroi.org is the European Meetings affiliate of the ROI Institute, which is based in the States. My colleague Ellen Hamzo runs a lot of events. The next one in London is on December the 7th and 8th. It's a two-day seminar where you will learn with a small number, more small select number, maybe up to eight fellow meeting planners, all about the ROI methodology, how you can implement it for the events that you might be holding yourselves, and you'll bring along a particular event you want help with, and Elling then acts as a consultant after that particular two-day seminar to help you implement the ROI methodology to be able to measure those particular events. So if you go to eventroi.org, you can learn about that next seminar. Um, another thing you might want to have a look at, and it's not listed here, we talked about the three reasons why people hold meetings and events, knowledge, networking, and motivation. That whole concept is all part of what we call meeting design or meeting architecture, which is a concept developed by Martin Burness. Burness. Thank you very much indeed, Martin Burness. You know him. Um, Martin Burness in Antwerp, and it's all part of the Meeting uh, Design Institute. So again, you can go online. There's a lot of help and information there in terms of if you're looking at ways that you can improve um, your knowledge network and motivation, some, some ideas in terms of how you can implement some of those things for your meetings. As I mentioned, Jack and, and Patty have written some books, um, and one that might be pertinent to you with regards to meetings and events is proving the value of meetings and events. Again, these can be found on, online, through Amazon, whatever. Beyond learning objectives, a particularly useful one, because it really helps you establish what the objectives and how to write objectives. So you can go to your senior management and what have you write these are the objectives we should establish for this particular event. And again, very useful there as well. We won't do that. We've run out of time, ladies and gentlemen. So just leaves me to say thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you. thank you very much. We've covered an awful lot there. We've just gone sort of paintbrush thin over what would take two days at least on a whole seminar. So I appreciate your patience. If you would like a copy of my slides, Please come up with your business card. If any too pleased to send those to you. Um, but also go to eventroi.org and there's a lot more information there as well. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you.